This is our day three. This is our last event for our Crit Summer School. I hope you really enjoyed the sessions that have been passed already. So 11 sessions been done already, and we are coming to our 12th session where we have gathered, of course, people from different parts of the world, but they will be talking about technology, event management, and SDGs. So without further ado, let me quickly get you through the session guidelines for the participants, followed by uh, be presentable, be respectful to others and chat responsibly, communicate with others and be prepared. Uh, our question answer session will be taken through the Slido. You can scan the QR code and you can post your questions and our speakers will take the question at the end of their session. So at the last, they will speak. Our, our assistant moderators will post the link, direct link to the break, uh, to the sessions of the question answer session so that you can quickly click and, and post your question. Moving forward to our moderator for this session, uh, it's Mr. Chorban from Taylor's University, Malaysia. I may uh, call upon Ms. Chor, uh, Mr. Chorban. You can take the floor. Thank you very right. much. Hi, everyone can hear me? <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. I will just take over the screen. All right, is everyone can see my screen? Yes. Everyone can see my screen, right? Yes. Okay, yes, okay. yeah. Welcome to the Center for Research and Innovations in Tourism and Food Studies. This is Choban, your moderator for session 12, Technology, Event Management, and SDG. Okay. So for this, okay, for this afternoon, as an event educator, practitioner, and certified digital event strategist, I will need to ensure this session is well coordinated. For that, please allow me to make a quick session announcement. First of all, please fasten your seatbelt. <laughs> yeah, this charter aircraft for second grade summer school is departing from Malaysia shortly. And the flight is bound for Australia. In Australia, we will be meeting as Associate Professor Dr. Judith Meyer from University of Queensland. She will be sharing the topic of technology and events towards the UN SDG. Next, we will travel from Australia to Philippines. In Philippines, we will be meeting up with Associate Professor Dr. Maria from Far Eastern University, and she will be sharing the topic of existing exit the metric, moving to an innovative event skit. Next, from Philippines, it's a trip back to Malaysia. In Malaysia, we will be meeting with uh, Dr. Lisa from Taylor's University, Malaysia. And she will be sharing the topic of technology and events, building resilience through technology. After all, there will be an interaction time and wrap up with feedback. First, we have to travel from Malaysia. Yeah, from Malaysia to Australia. Okay, now we are in Australia. This is the beauty of virtual event, just a click away, right? We are going to make up with uh, Associate Professor Dr. Judy Maria. 
at the UQ Business School, University of Queensland, Australia. Her work aimed to understand and enhance the positive impact of tourism and events on community and society, which was them. She is working on a number of projects in the field of including Olympic Games legacy, the link between event and social connectivity, and assessing the positive, uh, the potential impact of climate change on the tourism and event sector. Let's welcome Associate Professor Dr. Judith Meyer from University of Queensland, Australia. Hi, Prof Associate Professor, are you there? I am here, thank you very much. All right, the floor is yours. You can take over the screen now. <laughs> thank you. I will share my screen now. Yeah. Right, let me just get myself organized. Hopefully this is going to work. Mm, okay, yeah. everyone can see that screen. Oh, I've gone. gone yes, awesome. <laughs> we can see the very beautiful purple color. Myself. Thank you. That is, <laughs> that is our university color. We, we own the color purple now. <laughs> oh, okay, great. <laughs> so the thank, you. Yours. thank you so much for the invitation and the opportunity to present as part of this Crit Summer School. It's my pleasure to be here and to talk to you today. Before I start, I would like to acknowledge um, on behalf of the University of Queensland, the traditional owners of Australian land and their custodianship of the land on which we meet. And we pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. And I'd like to extend that acknowledgement to any other Indigenous and First Nations people who might be listening today. So I'm going to talk to you about the metaverse. First of all, um, I don't actually know how many of you know about the metaverse, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what I mean. Then what the implications are for the events industry. And moving on from that, what that will mean for event sustainability. Uh, and, and the connections with some of the sustainable development goals. And then a few concluding remarks before I pass on to your next speaker. So what is the metaverse? Everything you wanted to know, but didn't dare to ask. And if you're a metaverse expert already, then please forgive me if this seems a little bit like metaverse 101 to you. The metaverse is a difficult thing to define. It's a vague term, it's a complex term, and it's understood slightly differently by different people. But broadly speaking, it's a virtual reality space in which users can interact with a computer generated environment and with other users within that environment. The metaverse is not a technology per se, but is rather a broad shift in how we interact with technology. And I note that it's speculative because we're still not fully sure how technology is going to develop and change. But it will change somehow. The metaverse, however it appears, is coming. Some of the key things that we see associated with the metaverse would be virtual reality and augmented reality, but we don't always have to think of complicated technology to experience the metaverse. Um, it can also include uh, the current platforms that we already use, things like your, your personal computer, your games consoles, and your smartphones. So it will be fairly well accessible to lots and lots of different people. Sometimes you'll hear reference to other terms, artificial intelligence, web 3.0, NFTs, blockchain, and sometimes you'll hear people talk about metaverses. So not one, but multiple metaverses existing in something we might call the omniverse. Confused yet? I wouldn't be surprised because I am, but I'm going to try and unpack some of that for you. So a bit of a glossary to help you out here. Virtual reality is computer generated simulation of a three dimensional image or environment that you interact with in a way that makes you feel that you're there. 
You need special equipment for this. It's usually a virtual reality headset, but it might also include um, gloves that are fitted with sensors so that you can feel that you're using your hands. Augmented reality, which is AR, is a technology that superimposes the computer generated image onto your view of the real world. And it provides a composite view of the real world plus some kind of animated or virtual element. So I'll just move these here so that you can see. So if you are hunting down Pokemons, then there may be, in fact, not a Pokemon actually in the street, but an augmented reality picture of one. More words to help you out here, definitions, artificial intelligence, which we've heard of, systems or machines that can mimic human intelligence and learn. So they learn iteratively. Web 3.0. So where the, the World Wide Web that we know of at the moment tends to be centralized by what's known as big tech. So that might be Google, Amazon, Facebook, et cetera. Web 3 will be decentralized and it will incorporate blockchain technologies, um, and cryptocurrencies and non-fungible tokens, or NFTs. Oh, hope you're still keeping up. So what do I mean by cryptocurrency? These are digital currencies in which transactions are verified and recorded using a, a cryptograph system. So rather than a centralized um, authority like a bank. So an example of a cryptocurrency is Bitcoin. Blockchain. And I will confess this is starting to get to the limits of my knowledge of this complicated stuff. But blockchain is a distributed database or ledger that is shared amongst the nodes of a computer network. And it stores information in a decentralized way, allowing the crypto uh, currency transactions to be stored. An NFT is a non-fungible token. Let's move this again a financial security consisting of digital data stored in the blockchain. The ownership of the NFT is recorded in the blockchain and can be transferred, so NFTs can be sold and traded. And there was a work fairly recently called Nyan or Neon Cat by Chris Torres, which sold for 590,000 American dollars recently. And that is it. And that might surprise you that that's worth $590,000. I can't explain why. But nonetheless, it is. <sighs> so I hope that this hasn't been too much uh, technology that I've thrown at you. But there's a reason why I'm talking about the metaverse. So the metaverse and events. Why am I telling you about metaverse? Well, it's because the technologies associated with the metaverse will impact the events industry. And because of that, those of us who work and research in events and event managers and event funders and organizers will need to know what's coming because they will need to start preparing. And in some areas they already have. So arguably the, uh, the um, exhibition and trade show industry is ahead of the curve here because they've been operating virtual exhibitions and trade shows for many years. Another element of sporting events that will have uh, an implication for the metaverse is esports. And in fact, it has been rumored that esports will become an Olympic sport soon. Now, at the moment, esports are organized multiplayer game, uh, video game competitions. And where they are professional, they're played between professional players, either individuals or teams. But by 2023, that's next year, it's estimated that over 46 million people will be watching esports events. Now, normally, at the moment, we watch esports by through streaming platforms like Twitch or YouTube Live. But the metaverse will allow attendees to be in a virtual audience. So rather than sitting at home and watching a live stream, you will feel that you are virtually in the audience at the virtual venue, interacting with other gaming experiences all in the virtual space. Music events are also transferring into the metaverse. So Facebook, now Meta, ran a series of very big name musical concerts on their Horizon Venues metaverse platform, included a, a famous rapper, Young Thug. And 
Fortnite, which you'll certainly have heard of if you have younger children, um, which has 200 million players around the globe, ran concerts with both Travis Scott and Ariana Grande in the Fortnite metaverse, and they were attended by tens of millions of Fortnite players. And artists can, attend, artists can earn up to $350,000 per appearance in a game and much more for doing a virtual metaverse concert. And sports events won't be left behind either. Manchester City, um, that's a um, football soccer uh, club, and its partner, Sony, are building a virtual replica of the Etihad Stadium, which will be the team's central hub in the metaverse. And they say the whole point that we could imagine of having a metaverse is to recreate the game, to watch the game live, but to be part of the action in a different way. You can watch different angles and you can fill the stadium as much as you want because it's unlimited. It's completely virtual where you can sell one ticket in real world. You can sell a million tickets in the metaverse. So what are we going to do? How are we going to cope with all of this new technology? There will be impacts on the audience experience and the way we engage with events. And this will have um, relevance for this new term, which I always struggle with, which is called fidgetal, uh, which is a combination of physical attendance and digital attendance. But it also will have huge impacts on cybersecurity. You know, you may not know that during the Tokyo Olympics, during the two weeks of the Tokyo Olympics, with no spectators, there were 450 million cyber attacks. All were repelled by the Tokyo Olympic cyber team, but you can imagine that that's only going to increase. So why am I talking about metaverse technologies in the same presentation as uh, talking about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals? It's because I think that we can argue that, in fact, the, the virtual access to events that is um, being provided by the metaverse will actually allow us to impact sustainability in a number of key ways. But for the moment, two things that I particularly want to highlight. Firstly, not so many of us will have to travel to attend events. If we can attend them virtually, then many people will choose to do that, and that will significantly cut down on the carbon emissions associated with events and the other environmental impacts of attending events. Secondly, the virtual access to events will enhance accessibility to events, particularly to those who are previously disadvantaged or marginalized, or indeed are currently disadvantaged or marginalized in some way by lack of ability to attend. So I just want to talk about those a little bit more now. So if we think about um, the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goal number 13, which is around climate action, if we can reduce travel to attend events, but still have a high fidelity event experience, albeit virtually, then we are already starting to make inroads into contributing towards reducing carbon emissions. So instead of traveling around the world to attend an event, attendees will be able to have a virtual experience. And as time goes on and technology improves, the, the fidelity, the experience of that virtual event will improve to the extent that you will be able to feel that you are at the event, you will be able to feel that you are surrounded by other people at the event, yet it will all happen virtually. So you'll be able to have a seat in the metaverse without leaving your favorite seat in your living room. And additionally to that, the technology that is being developed will allow us to attend the event physically. Perhaps it's taking place in your area, and so it's, you know, it's easy for you to get to, but at the same time, co-experience that with family and friends and other people who are attending virtually through virtual reality. So it won't be so much a case of sitting on your own live streaming an event, which is what we might do now, but actually you will feel that you are there and you will feel that you are there with your friends and family and you will feel that you are there with the whatever kind of event it is with the audience with the spectators with the participants 
If we have a look now at um, the sustainable development goal number 10 around reduced inequalities, the other point that I would like to make is that there's a potential, at least for the metaverse or for um, the convergence anyway of digital and, and physical attendance uh, and operation of events to enhance accessibility to events. Now, events, as you would imagine, have traditionally been exclusive in many ways. One of the, the things that excludes people is, um, a, is a physical constraint. So people who are perhaps disabled, people who are uh, mobility impaired, or people who have other reasons why traveling is difficult. But there's also people who are disadvantaged through financial reasons. Many events are expensive, and it's not always easy to get tickets. And some people are, are, are excluded socially uh, in the sense that they may not technically be excluded but they may feel that they're not welcome they may feel that it's not for them they may feel that they shouldn't attend so there are a number of ways in which events have traditionally excluded uh, sections of the population what we can say about the virtual events is that they will be much cheaper to attend for the the your average person than a physical event primarily because the event organizers can sell as many tickets as they like. There'll be no physical um, constraints on the number of tickets they can sell. So whilst it might cost $100 to attend physically um, for one person, you might be able to have a million people attending virtually. They may all only you know, pay $1 each, but they'll still be making a lot of money. But virtual events will also help to remove physical access difficulties. So as I said, if there are if people have problems with um, a physical access element of an event, then the virtual event will allow them to have an experience that is um, immersive and inclusive. And, and finally, you know, as I mentioned, any concerns around social bias, not feeling welcome, perhaps being a member of some kind of group that is disadvantaged or marginalized, uh, virtual events will help to remove those barriers and will help to democratize access for lots of different people who want to attend events, but for whatever reason have felt that they were excluded. Now, just to give you an example of this, I'm going to use the example of Boccia. So the Boccia story is about reducing inequalities for those living with a disability. Boccia is a game that is similar to lawn bowling. Um, but it's a score-based ball-throwing game specifically developed for wheelchair users. And it's one of only two Paralympic sport that has no Olympic counterpart. Now, there are various barriers that make long-distance travel for any wheelchair user, but specifically electric wheelchair users, very difficult. It's a very challenging thing to travel a long distance when you're an electric wheelchair user. And on average, you may or may not know this, but para-athletes take up to three times as long as able-bodied athletes to access sporting events. So if it takes your normal able-bodied athlete one hour to get up, get changed, drive to the venue and, and be ready to start, you can imagine that the para-athletes can take up to three hours because of the extended length of time that's needed and support that's needed to help them get up, to help them wash, to help them get ready, and then to transport them to a venue. This was trialed in Japan using student botia players. And the idea was that the event would take place entirely virtually. Now it's not in the, it's not in the metaverse in this particular sense. It's not that it was a virtual event, but instead, everyone who was competing took place in their own um, domestic area without having to travel. But at the same time, all the scores and timing were done uh, online and there was virtual connection at all times. So each team played remotely from their own gymnasium that was convenient to them. And the organizers in Tokyo um, basically gave out the instructions and the orders and, and made sure that they captured all the timings, etc. And the distances, distances is very important in Boccia. And each match within each gymnasium was controlled by a specific executive who was the referee. And the organizers watched this via the live stream. And this was a very successful starting event to help people who have difficulties traveling to still compete with people who are not in the same um, physical or geographical locality. 
at the moment, as I said, this wasn't a virtual event necessarily in the sense that it wasn't in virtual reality, but I think we can imagine that in times to come, this will be held in virtual reality. And so not only will people not have to travel, they will still also feel that they are part of the larger event. They'll feel that they can hear the crowd. They will feel that they can see their competitors. This has significant implications for para sports and for other athletes who have issues with travel and mobility. So I have some concluding thoughts, but obviously happy to discuss um, if you have any questions later. The metaverse or metaverses or omniverse or whatever we want to call it, this is coming. So technology is developing. We don't necessarily know exactly what it's going to look like, but we've got a decent idea and we need to start preparing for it as researchers and as event organizers. The digital, so physical digital world will change the way that we organize and experience events. And again, this will happen. Um, what we want to make sure is that we are not uh, at the end of the queue when it comes to understanding this technology. Now, there is potential for positive progress in our efforts towards achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, particularly in the areas I spoke around um, climate action and reducing um, inequality. However, there are other issues that are raised by the metaverse, such as uh, how is it going to be funded? Who is going to be able to access the technology? How expensive will the technology be? Where are we getting the electricity from to run all that technology? So I can't say for certain that the metaverse will fully answer our questions in terms of sustainability, but I think it will make some specific uh, steps towards what we might want to achieve. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you found that interesting and look forward to uh, discussing uh, in, in due course. Thank you, Mr. Carvan. Yeah, thank you. This was a very wonderful sharing. Yeah, let me share the screen. Oh, okay. All right, thank you so much to Associate Professor Dr. Judy Meyer from University of Queensland, Australia for the wonderful sharing. Right, and now, we have to travel from Australia to Philippines. Why? Why we want to travel to Philippines? Because we need to make up with Associate Professor Maria, who is an academician, author, consultant, and my tourism and special event strategist. She has over 30 years of solid experience in marketing and communication, training, strategic management, and event management for major multinational company and government agency. She has managed international business events, special events, and for that, she received several awards for the area of innovative concept and strategic execution. Currently, she is the Vice President for the Academic Affair at the Asia Pacific Institute for Event Management and Associate Professor at the Institute of Tourism and Hotel Management at Far Eastern University. She has been awarded as one of the top one of the top 10 outstanding faculty, and she is also a regular speaker on tourism and business. Her research area focuses on mind tourism, special events, sustainability, information and communication technology, and creative tourism. She has also written five tourism and hospitality textbooks. She is also one of the authors in international best practice in event management. Let's welcome Associate Professor Maria. 
Yeah, sorry, I can. Okay, let's welcome Associate Professor Maria. Come to the stage. You can take over the screen now and you can test your mic. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you very much. That was a, a very nice introduction. And yes, just please call me Maria. Let oh. me uh, share my screen. Okay. Yeah, we're in the Philippines. You can see your yes. Okay. Getting it ready. Yes. Welcome to the Philippines. Okay. Hold yes, on. we can see your screen now. And perhaps you want to make it full screen. Yes, it's full screen now. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you also. I'd like to say hello, good day to everyone. And uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to be with the Second Crit Summer School at Taylor's University. It's such a wonderful privilege to be with the icons in the industry. And I'll be talking about exiting the matrix. What does that mean as we move into an innovative eventscape? Let me tell you about the Philippines and what we've been um, up to during the pandemic. The Philippines is actually the first country to have established the first commercial airline, the Philippine Airlines. We also set up and built the first convention center, the Philippine International Convention Center. So that probably gives you an idea on how much we are so into maesterism and special events. So just recently, we have actually hosted the World Travel and Tourism Council, the Global Summit last March. And we've just finished the Back into the Blue One with the Sea Diving Exposition to bring you back to the Philippines and enjoy our hospitality. Now, in terms of special events, the country seems to be able to think of so many reasons to have an activity. So we have educational tours, we have religious, historical, social. We love the performing arts from ballet to orchestra, chamber music and choir. And you have probably heard we have a group of people who are so obsessed with beauty pageants. And the three circles that you could see at the top, this represent the Grand uh, Lantern Festival in Pampanga, which is north of where I am in the National Capital Region. And uh, I'd like to inform you, ladies and gentlemen, that the Philippines celebrates the longest Christmas in the world, and it's about to start in September, ends in January. However, it's not business as usual for the events industry, specifically from a country that's in the Southeast Asian region with 7,000, more than 7,000 islands. And I'd like to take your thing about this. Sustainability is really not just about climate change and carbon footprint and single plastic use. Innovation is also more than technology, mobile app, and uh, software. And inclusion goes beyond gender, race, and creed. Event sustainability, as defined by the Events Industry Council, is about natural environment preservation, inclusive society, and a thriving economy. And according to their latest researches, they said that 17% of event respondents said that they have sustainable policies in their operations, but 30% of them are not using this into their event management. And 56% are totally clueless what this is all about. And what can we say? We have to be honest. Events are really not sustainable. It's usually a one-off wherein we uh, come into a destination, come into a convention center, set it up, establish, break down, and egress. Especially for some of the Olympic infrastructure that's not built, these are just left there and we just keep up with the uh, pollution, the carbon, um, all of these computations about how we're not helping with climate change. And from Professor Dr. Sigala, she was saying that this time with COVID and what we have hopefully learned, we should have multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and intradisciplinary approaches that are more 
collaborative. So we're looking at more adaptive strategies now, especially that we're in a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous environment. They call it VUCA, but as early as 2008, experts have been saying that a top-down approach may not be really the best way to do this. Maybe more consultations with the, our stakeholders. Maybe we have to really change our mindset. And as we all know, the pandemic really forced it upon us. Technologies is equal to innovation, inclusivity, and sustainability. And we have been hearing for the past three days, and thank you for still being with us, that this is about seamless integration, management of waste, customer satisfaction, collaborative work, information dissemination, co-creation. Yeah, they can all do that and more. But there are challenges in ICT, especially for a country with one of the slowest internet connection. There are financial and strategic objectives that are overlapping, contradictory, and there are cost implications. You can imagine that in an event, these objectives are not the same as the objectives of the sponsor, the delegates, the partners, and the exhibitors. With data, if there is data, it should be available, but privacy and confidentiality are the key issues that we need to do. And ownership and the use of data is also something that we should think about. In terms of government, we have just uh, welcomed our new Department of Tourism Secretary. And of course, she would have her priorities, the need for funding these priorities, and the logistical support, especially for events. We are very familiar how logistical support in an event is very similar to a military expedition. The metrics can be so difficult, so challenging, so confusing, and are usually designed for mega and hallmark events. There are also challenges related to sustainability and inclusivity. The certifications are overlapping, different standards, and are expensive. Suppliers may not necessarily have the intention to greenwash, but they are not familiar with all of what is necessary to be called organic or to be called green. And of course, there are limited options with an event organizer who is requiring to bring back all the revenues he or she lost, then they might just go back to their regular suppliers. The small and medium scale enterprise is very limited participation. And 80%, as per researchers all over the world, almost 80% are coming from this very large, fragmented, dynamic group of small and medium scale enterprises. And in terms of branding, as an event planner, festival organizer, what do we really say? Are we really sustainable? At which part, like the planning part or the implementation part, or why are we even saying it? And how do we say it? And is it even important? And in terms of definitions, oh my goodness, sustainability has now been replaced by regenerative. Sustainability is making sure that we leave the environment for the next generation to enjoy, but regenerative means adding, making sure that we improve and enhance not just make it available for the next generation. And of course, you have green, circular, you have responsible. So these definitions may not necessarily mean the same thing, but they sound very synonymous. And it's very important. Let's go to the basic. What's in there for someone, a stakeholder, a supplier, a sponsor, a partner, to get involved in a sustainability initiative. Well, for one, they can work at home, they can access their gadgets, their minimum lifestyle disruption, you can just stay where you are. It's gonna be accessible to more people. It's safe, secure. You gotta think of your financials and maybe you have something about brand value and reputation. So we've got to get to that basic. Is it really important for them? And do they see it important? Because sometimes we as researchers and academicians think of it in a more macro level when we need now to get bound to brass tacks. 
what is really event sustainability? There's very limited knowledge. Researchers have shown that just because also of the uh, numerous terminologies that are used that can be confusing, the knowledge is not as clear as we would like to. They're also more interested, as I mentioned, to recover investments. There's also limited empirical data discussing its role and application, especially for local, not international events, not mega events, but festivals that are heard, held in a specific destination. And sustainability cuts across all these disciplines and all these applications. So we are saying that with the uh, adaptive strategies, maybe we could take a look at what approaches would be best that are uniquely, specifically designed for an event and a destination. And when we go to the innovative part, then we've got to have new roles. If uh, metaverse, like what Dr. Meir is saying, and our other icons have been mentioning that there will be more artificial intelligence, robotics, then we should have new roles for everybody in our team, which means there are new skills that we need to learn. But we've got to be creative as well. We've got to be authentic. We've got to be engaging. And for the bottom line, we've got to look at new business models on how we really can put all of this together to deliver the expectations or even exceed the expectations of our stakeholders. In terms of inclusivity, it goes the range from age and gender and religion and race and identity and special needs. I remember an event where I was part of the secretariat when the solution to fix the meal setup was to ask our delegates, our sponsors and partners, their specific, their unique meal requirements. So the solution was all people who had diabetic requirements would sit at the same table. Those who are vegan on one table, allergic to crustacean would be in another table. Of course, the complaint was, I want to be seated near my friends. But what we did was extend the time for lunch, for the meals, the dinner, have more cocktails in between so that they can be with their friends, but we can manage the inclusive requirements of all their meals. Now, what have we done? What have we done in the Philippines as far as uh, technologies, innovation, inclusivity, and sustainability? What you see on your left that's mostly green is called e burol. Burol in English means wake. Okay, so in the Philippines, the um, families and friends actually stay with the wake throughout the wake. But because of the pandemic, then they had to come up with a way for us to view, pray together, and sympathize and empathize with the bereaved family. Of course, we had an online mass for our Catholic Christian friends. We also have the festival for our Muslim celebrations. What else? We also had an invitation. This was for Filipino classical musicians to record their own music, their own part, send it to Kuwait, and the sound engineer and the producer would put it together and set up a major performance of classical musicians from the Philippines, Kuwait, and other performers with a choir on YouTube. And there's this one thing that's really fast becoming an obsession to a lot also. It's called the online selling. If you remove the online part, it's simply a pitch. But what makes it exciting is that you've got to get there first. You've got to choose your item first and make sure that the person selling gets to get your message. Interesting. What else? On a national level, we participated in the Bangkota Philippine Pavilion, Pavilion in Dubai Expo, and it highlighted sustainability and our cultural sensitivities. We also had the MICE Conference 2020 in the Philippines, which was hybrid. What I'd like to share about this is the experience of, it's as if I was there. Of course, there were still barriers because I was just watching like you over the internet, but I received the gift, the token for having registered ahead, and I was able to use it 
in time to watch the entire event. They sent um, some gifts that included a um, earphone. They also sent a ring light. So these are very useful swag. That's what they call it now for participating in the event. Bicycle tourism is very sustainable. On the contrary, there is not much, at least in the Philippines and in some uh, countries in Asia, that technology has not yet in, in come in for bicycle tourism. We also recently hosted the UCI gravel uh, tourism competition in Nueva Ecija. That's another province in the north from where I am in the Metro Manila area. And we are now looking on the reverse side. If we were using technology to drive more of the events, this one is a very sustainable activity, a very sustainable event that may require the use of technology. For example, drones. Drones can be used to spite bikers in distress. They can also deliver emergency supplies. A mobile app that would give us weather reports, where the tourist attractions are, how to call for assistance, especially for medical and mechanical requirements, and where the bike stops are. And there could be a portal where the bike shops, events, and the bike groups can come together, create their own events, co-create what they need to do, as well as come up with nutrition, wellness, fitness, and security tips. So this is more on the reverse side. So what do I mean by exiting the matrix? I'm sure you're familiar. To us, to be red-pilled, we have to look at what we've learned pre-pandemic, pick up what is good, but create something that is new, develop something more so that we can move further and not allow this pandemic to stop us. And technology can help us in that way. But what we are saying also is we leave the technology as a tool, but we focus on the relationships, on the connections. The resilience is there, but we have to be a little more cultural sensitive. Look at ethical practices, the willingness to embrace change, and coming from a Filipina, let's keep the fun part there. We're also moving forward with Philippine Innovation. This is a new Republic Act that is designed to encourage develop more innovation in the areas of technology, inclusivity, and this basically covers all of the SDGs in our United Nations uh, list. Recommendations called from experts as well include the use of social media. Why? Social media is most basic in the Philippines. Do you know that we spend 10 hours and 27 minutes per day on the internet? That's where we get our news. That's where we collaborate, coordinate, keep in touch. And we can use this to share information, get people excited so that they don't get missed out or left behind about sustainability initiatives. We can also develop a sustainable toolkit that specifically tells us where at that point in an event is it necessary, is it feasible, it is applicable. And the action-oriented discussions in our classrooms should include ethical implications. There should be a buy-in from SMEs because, again, they are the majority of the event industry and allow them to collaborate. They can actually come up with fantastic ideas because they come from where we are going. The host communities have been there. They know what to do. They know where to go. They know where to source let them into our world and we should design new metrics i mentioned that the metrics can be challenging difficult expensive confusing that leaves a person an event a planner a festival organizer to just like you know it's just so hard to do this is there any way that we can measure and contribute at the same time and we've got to create best new practices Keep the old that has been working and will still work, but come up with best new practices. Future research agenda could include a whole range of ideas on how we can really improve ourselves while contributing to the sustainability of the mice tourism and events industry. We can upskill, 
business models, creativity in the concepts, new tourism indicators, maybe a combination of the products like an intangible heritage activity as an incentive tour, certifications and accreditations that are within the level of the SMEs and those who are willing and interested to upskill, impact analysis from the local, national, as well as regional levels, monitoring the participant journey, not just the customer, not just the delegate, not just the sponsor, not just the exhibitor, for us to know exactly what their feedback is. Sponsorship value used for hybrid face-to-face -face will have to change as well. Like how do we really get them on our side as they generate their ROI? And please let us include our indigenous peoples they know what sustainability is about. They've been there. They're surviving. They know how it was long before this technology has started. So I would like to close with this statement saying, what is really most important about ICT or information and communications technology is not so much the availability of that device or the internet, but rather the people's ability to make use of that device and engage in meaning. Maraming salamat po, mabuhay. Maria Arlene Nisimulasyon from the Philippines. Thank you so much. Back to you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. All right. It's a good sharing by Associate Professor Maria from Far Eastern University, Philippines that she has mentioned that events are not sustainable with some of the reasons. And then for the technology, it should be having innovation, inclusivity, and sustainability. She has also shared about the Philippine innovations together with the future research agenda, which is a very good sharing. And I believe this is somehow very insightful. And we can see some of the questions available, uh, some of the question pop in this slide though. But I would like to take this opportunity as well to encourage if you have any questions, you can just put it on the slide though, that my assistant over there, they will share a link. Yeah, you put all the questions over there, then right after the next sections, we will have the interactive session, right? So after the wonderful sharing by a so, um, yeah, after wonderful sharing by Associate Professor Maria from Far Eastern University, Philippines, and now we have to travel from Philippines to Malaysia to make up with Dr. Lisa Tong. Dr. Lisa Tong is a program director for the event and tourism management undergrad program at the School of Hospitality, Tourism and Events, Taylor University, Malaysia. She joined the education industry since 2003 and taught hospitality and marketing related module before moving on to event management module in 2006. She has guided students in numbers of events including business events, special events. And she was also involved in registrations, sponsorships, and logistic committee for international conference, company annual dinner, program launching, and together with universities events. In addition, she has been involved in curriculum design for events and tourism management program throughout her appointment as the program director. She managed the administrations and documentations for program accreditations, student study plan, and overall development of events and tourism management program. This afternoon, she will be sharing the topic of technology and events Building resilience through technology. Let's welcome Dr. Lisa Tung. Hi, Dr. Lisa Tung, are you there? Hi, Choban. Thank you very much. All right. Can you take over the screen? 
and the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Let me share my screen. You able to see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you to um, Great Summer School for giving me the opportunity to speak in today's session on technology and events. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, uh, depending on where you are coming from. So I'll be um, sharing a bit about technology and events, building resilience through technology. So this will be the outline to the presentation. which I will cover relating a bit to technology, some sharing some statistics and some examples of uh, collaboration between suppliers, and then finally to touch on building resilience. So over the last few years, or more likely the last two to three years, uh, that things have changed within the events industry, uh, particularly in terms of the use of technology in events, where it has actually been accelerated due to COVID-19. And in the past, Technology was more like uh, added advantage to certain events in terms of creating the overall experience, but now it has become a necessity. Okay, in which why also probably because of the group of people, the attendees who are coming in to events, get okay, different types of events, and millennials are actually fast becoming the biggest segment of the global workforce in which the adoption of mobile technologies are increasingly integrated into our lives. So that plays a role as well in terms of the growth of technology and the use of technology in events. And event technology will evolve the industry and I agree with uh, what uh, Professor, Associate Professor Judith mentioned earlier that with the use of metaverse, it has actually the different association of technologies implemented in metaverse itself will have an impact on events. And based on some studies that have been conducted, event audiences are ready to adapt event digitization. And also looking into the aspect that um, the use of technologies, the different types of technologies, the development of technology itself have brought about automation of tasks, which can make it flexible in the implementation of event planning as well as execution and at the same time adding value to events by providing insights on big data, sharing information of attendees, uh, profiling in order to let us know how we can plan better and creating different memorable experiences for audience for different types of events and virtual events as what we see over the last two years itself it's here to stay. Uh, it's going to continue as a trend as now because you will have virtual and hybrid events incorporated along the way in different types of events. And what we have this three days, the last three days itself for the Grid Summer School, we're having this virtual events and it is possible with the platforms, with the availability of technology, where we can bring so many people together in one single event coming from different profiles and countries. So most of us here with the use of uh, technology and different platforms as what um, the VP of product marketing and events from event will be mentioned, there is hardly anyone anymore who doesn't know how to get to grips with event technology. Somehow or rather in our daily lives we are involved in the use of technology and this is also being seen in events, how events are being uh, evolving in terms of with the adoption of technology. So you can see here some statistics from uh, skip meetings. 73% of planners have been able to successfully pivot their event to virtual. And this is something that is very important, uh, especially in the context of like in Malaysia over the last two years, we only started or restarted the events, uh, operation of events itself in October, 2021. And before that, it was like a complete stop events had to be cancelled, events had to be postponed, and there were not much activities and things ongoing with uh, during the movement control order. So the opportunity there that was created was to move to virtual or online events. 
and 71% of planners plan to continue to employ a digital strategy some, in some form to maintain their virtual audience okay, once they are able to return to physical events. So now that we have already restarted with physical events, most of the physical events that are implemented also have the element of the option with virtual, okay, which is the hybrid component of the event added on. 76% of app developers say that demand in the late in the event app space is higher than it was within the last year. And 65% of visitors expect that digital event technology will still have utility after the pandemic ends. And 53% of event professionals consider themselves comfortable or savvy with virtual event tech. Yeah, I just want to share um, an idea or collaboration between two suppliers in the context of Malaysia, where we have an event provider and also don't bring me sound and light uh, company who have collaborated in order to change the offering of the services or the products in order to cater to the events industry. Welcome to the Tier City Convention Centre. As you are aware, things have changed in the way we conduct events due to the current situation. Therefore, we at the Tier City Convention Centre would like to show to you an innovative way and also in a safe manner how we can conduct events in the future. Let me show it to you. Let me introduce you to our virtual studio. What it does is that it transforms the green screen I have behind me to any type of virtual background that you need. Something like this. It can be for any business presentation, whether for training, seminar, or workshop, whether recorded live or online. Or we can do a Zoom meeting with a large audience, something like this. Any product launch, like this car launch. Interview or talk show, whether on-site or online. Now, if you want event best of both worlds with a live participation and also with online audience, let me show you our hybrid studio. With an LED screen behind me, the possibility is limitless. For a hybrid event, we can have participants from our online participants from wherever they are, as well as our on-site audience. With a hybrid event, you are able to have interaction from our online participants as well as our on-site physical audience. Yes, you have a question. A what ceremony? This graduation ceremony. And this can be your wedding background. That was an example of uh, how during the pandemic, the venue providers they collaborated with uh, different suppliers. So Satya Convention Center was just one of the example. There are also other uh, hotels and uh, convention centers in Malaysia that have adapted to the situation in order to create new products and services to cater for events. So now move on a bit to some highlighting some of the technology trends that have been implemented after the pandemic and also some of it probably has already been used as an added advantage in the past, but then now it's uh, becoming more prominent and more frequent in events. You have um, instant contactless check-in, which is probably using facial recognition um, that makes it seamless and faster in terms of registration and cutting down queuing lines and so on where um, once a re uh, attendee for an event, they just need to register, upload their photos, and then upon uh, registration at physically at the event itself, they just need to uh, scan, and then their names and uh, destination, all the details will pop up, and all they need to do is just proceed and finish off with the check-in process, and then they will be able to get their instant badge and continue on their journey for the event. Then you have uh, hands-free temperature solutions. This was implemented um, during, with a lot of uh, SOPs during the pandemic, 
and some events uh, still have this or certain venues they still implement this. You also have um, use of uh, leveraging on AI assistance, okay, AI driven chatbots that you see in events, um, at venues, at exhibitions, in which these bots can actually help attendees uh, to find specific locations. Let's say they go into an exhibition hall, the exhibition space itself that directs them with a map to know where to go. Again, the highlighting on the schedule, the meal times, and many more. So all these services are actually integrated and many events now would develop their own event apps, which will have all the information stored and making it easily accessible for the attendees directly from their mobile phones with uh, additional functions like push notification telling them that, oh, this talk is going to start or there's an activity, the program is running in this room and so on. So all that information will be available. And one thing is also looking into the possibility for uh, appointments, particularly for business networking. Another thing is uh, in terms of integrated disinfection system. This is implemented in uh, various venues to ensure a safe and worryless <laughs> environment for their guests. So this Nano uh, X air purifier is also implemented in several um, convention centers in Malaysia, particularly Satya City Convention Center. Then the traceability event app that was also something that was developed okay, or implemented in which uh, even after the pandemic itself, it's still uh, visible to be used for other situations uh, in which it allows uh, real-time information for the attendee okay, to be able to know or detect uh, proximity information whenever they have uh, attendance in an event, a venue, and so on. So with the app installed, it provides them with uh, information to allow them to identify, let's say, during COVID-19, okay, or people who were near them who are infected with COVID-19. Okay, omni-channel event strategy. This is another um, area in terms of having um, most events, you probably have multiple channels um, in which you have access to information. You may have registration a platform, which is one channel. Then if they want to access online content is another channel, or if they want interaction is another channel. So omni-channel now is where you can have everything integrated together, okay, which is more of an integration of uh, digital communication channels, where instant messaging, uh, video conferencing, or one-to-one -one video conferencing, virtual event kiosks, all in the same platform. So it makes it easier and more convenient for the attendees in terms of their event experience, particularly for virtual events or hybrid events. Next, I'll move on to the area on building resilience through technology. When you talk about building resilience or business resilience, organizational resilience, business resilience is more of the capacity through which a business survives, recovers, and grows when a crisis disrupts its operation. Or in terms of organizational resilience, it can refer to an organization's ability to anticipate, prepare for, respond, and adapt to incremental change and sudden disruptions in order to survive and prosper. I think the uh, COVID-19 came as a shock to many people, to many industries. So some industries, some businesses, they were able to innovate, get through it, survive. Some basically, they just went out of business. So in terms of the impact itself in the context of uh, business events in Malaysia, before, COVID, yeah, before the pandemic, Malaysia's business events industry has been growing strongly and in 2019, they actually contributed to 3.9 ringgit, a billion ringgit direct expenditure and 9.2 billion ringgit in economic impact to the country. But during COVID-19 pandemic, based on the survey and research done by Masios, it recorded a 90% drop of business revenue in the business events economy. So what has been done within the community, the business events community, is in order to survive, event organizers change their business models to venture into different areas such as e-commerce, distribution, and virtual and hybrid events. There are also several companies that have been started during the movement control order where it's focusing mainly on virtual events. So we have to accept um, that 
event digitalization is here to stay. Somehow or rather the change of uh, situation, the change of the, the, the impact of the pandemic itself has greatly influenced the way in which event planners, businesses, organizers adapted the situation and modified their business model. So it has also changed the way of people's preferences in events. And based on the PCMA, um, UFI, and also STB, which is our tourism board, they found that there is a stronger appetite for digital or hybrid events in Asia. So during the pandemic um, and coming up to 2022, Masios and Malaysian Association of Convention and Exhibition Organizers and Suppliers developed their strategic roadmap for 2022 to 2030, which focuses on recovery, resilience, and sustainability. So this roadmap aims to maximize every opportunity, identifying possible gaps, seeking new business market, and ensuring that every stakeholder, industry stakeholder itself, understands the role that they play. And within the Marcel strategic roadmap, one of the strategy or the first key strategy is to embrace digital transformation. So you can see here their focus on the key strategy number one, which is embracing digital transformation, is focusing more on transforming business events in new landscape, looking at the recovery phase, the resilience phase, and also the sustainability phase. So at the resilience phase itself, it's really more on the creating a digital environment which will provide more opportunity for people to engage with the contents of the event, uh, share it, and also to continue to make connections with the business network, you know, within the business network. So they will have like uh, certain key activities looking into the use of technology as a tool okay, for business as usual. And also in case anything happens similarly again in the future, events can still continue. So I'm just gonna share with you an example of an um, of an event, which is the street street food virtual festival of how they have incorporated technology, uh, making this virtual event, uh, providing a lot of uh, impact from the event itself. Oh my God, this is so cool! Are you guys looking at what I'm looking? Tiger Beer is famous for its street food festivals. With Malaysians stuck at home, one of the biggest things they would yearn for was the experience of chowing down their local street food. We had a huge void to fill. With smartphone users reaching a near saturation level of 98.7%, we had to do the only logical thing. We brought Tiger Street Food Festival to them. I know what you're thinking. Do we create a world from scratch, test it every day, optimize the polygon count, create over 1,000 avatars, speak to every street food vendor in Malaysia, build a virtual stall for them, create exclusive dishes with them, feed thousands of festival goers with curated menus and free beer, and entertain them with games and a live performance? Yes. Yes, we did. Customize avatars? Check. Hanging out with your buddies? Check. Games? Check. Musical performance? Check. Free beer? Check. The best part? Your favorite local street food delivered right to your doorstep at the press of a button. The festival brought excitement over street food to new heights in the new normal. The results were beyond what we expected, and our street food partners shared the success. Not to mention, we created a world's first by combining technology with our passion for local street food, we brought the festival spirit from the streets to your screens. Okay. So that, that was a video which is on the uh, street food festival. It's something us Malaysians, everything is about food. We enjoy our food basically. So that is how they, the, they came about this idea of the event to incorporate all the different elements and still providing uh, opportunities for other businesses. So now moving forward with um, the changes, new business models or adaptation to new business models by uh, various planners, organizers, and so on. So you have, I've mentioned earlier that uh, virtual and hybrid events are here to stay. It will, they will continue to stay in some form or uh, anyway. 
So you have um, what uh, Associate Professor Dr. Judith mentioned earlier, uh, highlighted earlier about NFTs and metaverse. So I just want to share some example, um, like NFTs, um, Coachella Music Festival, uh, what they've done this year was uh, they came up with the Coachella Collectibles that provides a lifetime access for festival passes. And then it allows the um, attendees to unlock unique on-site experiences, physical items, and also digital collectibles. So you can see, um, example, here in Coachella Keys Collection, their Sights and Sounds Collection, there were some of the uh, NFTs that were actually implemented as part of um, the event itself. And then you have uh, Metaverse, uh, won't go too, uh, in too detail on that because the associate professor, um, Dr. Judith has already mentioned on that. But there's something that uh, events that are implementing now in terms of having uh, different Metaverse uh, platforms, again, creating a different level of uh, experience. And then you also have uh, gamification. So you have uh, events now that not only they're running the usual programs and so on. Yes, you have the physical element of the events, you incorporate the virtual element of events, but at the same time to make it more interactive, to have more participations of uh, event attendees for these different events. They come up with uh, different ideas on how to be more innovative, to enhance the engaging experience for the attendees. So you have... <laughs> For example, uh, events that comes up with uh, different themes uh, for the event, and then they can have people taking part in games where they can complete certain goals, certain tasks, and then they gain points, and the points can be used for redemption of certain uh, gifts or things which is relevant within the context of the event itself. Then um, lastly, we have for VR and events. So virtual reality, augmented reality also uh, something that is being implemented in events and probably be seeing more uh, in the near future with implementation of virtual reality. Like um, it's more to use as uh, enhancement of the event experience in which like in Coachella Music Festival, they launched their own VR app, which allows the attendees to view it, to use it before the event, to view like a 360 degree uh, photo from previous year's event just to build up the excitement for the attendees. So that itself will uh, create the level of anticipation and excitement for the event that they're going to enter okay, within the current year's event. So just to conclude, um, virtual and hybrid events will continue and events need to adapt and grow with technology. And this is uh, what I agree with Associate Professor Maria mentioned earlier that event organizers, businesses, and so on need to have an adaptive and flexible strategy in order to uh, go with the flow, in order to adapt and grow with technology because technology itself helps in data analytics for better planning of future. And um, technology is not a replacement, something that I would like to highlight, it's not a replacement for events, but it is used as a tool for different uses in events, whether it is in the form of planning or data analytics, or in the form of uh, making it easier or better experience for events. So to stay resilient, it is necessary to incorporate technology at some point of the events management process. And events need to innovate in creating memorable experience. So that is something that I have sharing. Thank you very much uh, to everyone for staying in the session. Choban, um, pass the floor back to you. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Lisa, that you share about the something beauty about post-COVID-19 because we can see the co collaboration between suppliers. And there's also another video showing that the event technology meeting the expectation from different stakeholders and wrapped up with a word of, okay, event digitalization is here to stay. Yeah, I, I do agree with this phrase. I'm not sure the rest of you agree with me or not. Yeah, if you agree with me, maybe you can just type one over there. <laughs> All right, here comes to our networking yeah, Q&A session. So uh, I got some questions from the Slido and some of, some of the questions, they are looking similar. So I will just combine it together into one question. So I will be uh, 
asking one question for each of the speaker here. So the first question to Prof. Judith. This question is talking about metaverse. <laughs> yeah, will the metaverse give the real satisfaction compared to real travel experience? Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for the question. Uh, very interesting. And not okay. Something, not something I can give you the answer to necessarily straight away. My guess is that, as Dr. Lisa said, it will be, it's not to replace the experience. It's, it's an add-on to the experience. So I don't think that it will be, that we'll run events in the metaverse only. And that will be instead of live events. I think it will be an, an addition to a live event that will allow people who can't attend to attend, that will allow people who aren't able to travel to attend, to allow people who can't afford to attend. I don't think it will replace the, the, the physical event. And for that reason, I don't think it will ever provide exactly the same experience as attending a, a real event but I think it will be a very good substitute instead of what might be, you know, a very ordinary substitute, which might be sitting at home and watching on, uh, you know, on the internet. So I think, I think that would be my answer to that one. All right. Thank you so much. I think my take for this question is a bit like virtual events or virtual tourism. It's just an additional sales funnel that will be able to help people to close more deals and close, closing more deals, right? Yeah, uh, okay. I have another question, but this is towards uh, Associate Prop Maria. Hmm. This is about sustainability. Yeah, it is not always easy trying to make sustainability in a society where endless utilization of resources is there. And what do you say on this? <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you for the question. Actually, um, I'm going to come from this context. Um, sustainability, as I mentioned, is such a complex word. And it can mean so many different things for so many different people, so many different applications across an event. And I, I'd like to make one um, example. This is about a uh, multinational coffee shop, no names mentioned, who, that shifted to plastics, uh, I'm sorry, from, from plastic straw to paper straw. Very sustainable, very interesting. However, while you are sipping through your drink, you are now having a taste of that fantastic paper straw. So <laughs> it can be sustainable, yeah, but it may not be the right way to do it. Or if we just want to say, oh, we're doing something. So my, my answer would also be coming from another example we're in. In the Philippines, we've had several issues where in tomatoes and other fruits and vegetables were just thrown because there were no buyers and there was problems with the pandemic for the tracking and the freight. So as we are all saying with Professor uh, Mayer and Dr. Lisa as well, that it should be a collaboration. If we know that this is going to happen again for whatever reason, then let's bring in the manufacturing processing companies in. Because we're looking at event and these are our suppliers. You know, you have the stylist, you have the, the, the dresser, you have the makeup people, you have the production people. Why don't we bring the other industries and then ask our chef friends, say, what, what do we do with this truckload of tomatoes that we can use for a future major event? Or is there an event we can do? Like I know of a tomato throwing event somewhere in Europe, is that something that's going to be exciting? Because uh, I, I would like to go back to what we've been saying right from the beginning with all my idols and my, the icons here. Sustainability begins with us. It doesn't have to be complex, but it's got to be adapted to what is needed and it's got to be feasible because I personally don't like drinking paper straws. I hope I got to answer your question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Associate Prof. Maria. 
I think for the for the paper straw, I do have a joke. It's like, okay, yeah, you want to maintain sincerity and then you buy paper straw, but the paper straw is wrapped by the plastic. <laughs> right. All right. Thank you. Ah, yeah, there's also one question for you, Dr. Lisa. Okay, this is talking about the integration of technology change. Okay, integration of technology would, would change the perceived value of an event from the, from the perspective of consumer. The sample given over here is online concerts versus of uh, on-site concerts. Thank you for the question, Joran. I think um, uh, what Dr. Judy mentioned earlier, so it's really not a full replacement. Definitely, uh, online events may not be for everyone because we are humans. We need human interaction. We definitely would want physical events. We want that's why when when industry started, everyone's like, "Hey, let's go back to events and while maintaining SOP and so on." So I would say that it's more of um. For those who enjoy the online experience, then they will have a preference for it. But I would say to have the combination of both in which you can then capture a bigger audience for the ones who want the physical experience and also satisfying those who would go for like metaverse, they would go for VR, they would go for that type. Maybe the younger audience or the younger generation, the millennials would prefer that. But at the same time, I'm sure every one of us would want to go out and meet someone. We want the networking. We want the interaction. So the perception for the people attending the event is very, very uh, individual. But I would say that um, to have fully, fully online, it worked well during the pandemic because everyone is locked at home. They can't go out. And that's like the only thing that keeps them, say, events are still running. Okay, we just go. It's online. We can still have the experience. But when things are almost back to normal, people can start going out again, then the preference will change to physical events. All right, thank you, Dr. Lisa. Thank you. I think this is the dilemma between I want physical contact or I want contactless contact. <laughs> yeah, for, for sure, when we're talking about online concerts, I do have experience of online concerts. It was, it's an artist called Sam Smith, yeah, it's also an online concert. And yeah, you may need to in, invest some of the money on the equipment. Like say, okay, you, you need to have a fully blackout room, right? And then you have the projector and then you have the sound bar, everything. Then you will, you will have the sense to, okay, to feel it. But however, physical interactions is still the best, <laughs> right? Yeah, I think this is a uh, 529 over here. It's GMP plus eight. I think it's almost uh, what time? 7, 7 p.m. 7, oh no, it's almost 8 p.m. in Australia, right? So let's do a session summary over here. Maybe I can have all the speakers to give one sentence to wrap up this session and then I can pass it to MC. Can I have start with? with yeah, Associate Prof. Dr. Judy from Australia. After <laughs> that, I can go for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> yes, nearly dinner time. Um, thank you very much. It's very difficult to sum up in one sentence. So I would just say that um, the digital revolution is happening and it's really up to us to make sure that it happens as sustainably as possible. Hmm. All right, thank you so much. How about you, Associate Prof. Maria? Same with uh, Dr. May. It's very difficult to, to just compress it in one sentence, but uh, this is what I say. Like one advertising slogan, let's just do this. Let's, let's just do this. Let's just be part of it, no matter how small. And uh, let's, let's not allow ourselves to be stopped by the pandemic or to be blindsided by technology. Let's just get together. Thank you. Thank you. How about you, Dr. Lisa? Uh, it's always not the easiest to go the last. <laughs> but um, I, I do agree uh, with the two previous speakers. But I would like to say that uh, for maintaining, uh, no, for business resilience itself, we should learn to evolve. 
implement what is necessary and yes, while uh, being sustainable, but at the same time, somehow or other, we need to change in order for better solutions, better experience. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. My last take is, okay, event technology versus business conversions. Event technology eventually help business conversions. It's not going to bring up the, the business, right? Yes, I think we end this session definitely one and a half hours is not enough because there are even more to explore, right? Thank you for all the participants who are right here. Please stay back and get ready with your virtual background. Then I will pass it back to MC. Thank you.